Good morning, everyone. How are you? Just fine. Just fine. You didn't have a cup of coffee. If you need translation, I am told there is equipment in the back so you can have your simultaneous translation. I am not Austrian. I'm from Belgium. I'm a Belgian citizen, but in view of the hectic schedule, I'm already dressed like I'm going to the plane. Me being here is something like a kidnapping. I didn't think I was supposed to be here, but the forces were such that I am here. Last night, I was still speaking in Udine at 11.30 at night. Somehow, transport was organized. Thank you so much for doing that. But I'm here, and I'm glad I'm here, because it is key that we can talk to people in industry and in policy making. We have to leave the world of academia and the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations. We have to engage business directly. And the engagement of business, as I will try to present to you this morning, the engagement of business is around changing the business model we have to transform business into a new model. Because if you think you will further globalize, further compete by being the cheapest, you have no future. The only way to compete in the future is by generating more value the generation of multiple values is the main subject of my presentation this morning. Multiple values means multiple cash flow. Multiple cash flow means less risk. And that is not what we're used to know when we talk about innovation. We associate innovation with higher risk, leaving the domain in which we are comfortable. And therefore, we often need to go to a place where there is nothing to imagine. Here, I'm taking you to the south of Morocco in the Sahara. The Sahara is a unique place. But one thing is certain, for people like you and me, living there is a challenge. So it is now 92 years ago that a Frenchman landed with his breguet plane into the dunes of the Sahara and found these rocks. He packed them in his plane sent them to Paris, 1927. And in Paris, they said, you found meteorites. You found meteorites from seven different asteroids in the universe. That person who found out that he had discovered the meteorites was Saint-Exupéry. The seven meteorites are immortalized in Il Piccolo Principe. He was in the middle of nowhere, found seven rocks and imagined the most famous book. But it competes with Pinocchio. Pinocchio is about the same. But 
it's quite important to realize that he was operating in 1927 in the south of Morocco to ensure the transport of the airmail from Paris to Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires. And in 1927, they could do that in three days. Tre giorno. That's the same Federal Express and DHL does today. <laughs> and they had a plane flying 180 kilometers an hour. That plane could land in the dunes. Today, they can't. With other words, it tells us where do we come from? Where is imagination? Where can we go? This is the air strip built by Saint-Exupéry in the desert. He knew how to build it then, and it's still operational. Today, we can't build like that anymore. But the power of Saint-Exupéry is that it brings you to a place where you think you are in between two deserts. The desert Sahara and the desert Atlantic Ocean. Now, in between is life, creativity. And that's one of the areas where I work. Not to write another Piccolo Principe, but in order to look at seaweeds. We know the world needs more biomass. Biomass, if we want to be a bioeconomy, we need to have more sustainable source of biomass. The tree takes a long time. Even if we genetically modify the tree, still takes seven years for a tree to grow the mix of wood we need. Where are the next sources of biomass? And we have discovered that the highest density and the highest growth of biomass is not on land, it's in the sea. For a very simple reason. Along the sea, the force of gravity doesn't work the same. A tree must go against gravity, seaweed doesn't have to go against gravity. And for that simple reason, we know today that you can sustainably harvest a thousand tons of biomass of seaweed per hectare, provided you go 25 meters deep. That's three dimensions. When we're farming beetroots, corn, soy, we're using a thin space of the soil which grows maybe a meter high. That means that the biomass that is created in the water without the force of gravity, 25 meters deep where the light comes in, is 200 times more than we can ever do on land. So, why do we want to genetically modify soy or corn when you can get a hundred times more out of the sea? Now, La Laguna di Venezia is known for algae. You think it's a problem. You do everything to kill it, to control it, to manage it. Why don't you just harvest it and turn it into an industrial product? We have learned in Morocco that out of the 2,000 varieties of seaweeds in the Atlantic Ocean, at least 200 are extraordinary for the adsorption of microplastici. We're absorbing microplastics and we think it's a big problem. It is a problem if you have no solution. This is where we need scientific research. But I immediately switch on my mind as entrepreneur and business person. Who pays? Where is the cash flow? 
What is the revenue model? How can I translate the adsorption into a model that finances this, not today, not tomorrow, but for the next hundred years? Because we're going to have to clean up microplastics for another hundred years. That's the reality. So, we have developed a model now to farm seaweeds at high density only using the nutrition from the ocean, not adding additional nutrition, regenerating the forests of the sea, bringing back the mollusks, the urchins, bringing back the fish, recreating an ecosystem, and you're harvesting the seaweed as if it were grass. You cut it, it grows again. You cut it, it grows again. You cut it, it grows again. This is amazing. Why do you want to be a farmer? Plant, and uh, you harvest, plant again. Harvest, plant again. Who invented that logic? The real logic is you go with perennials. Seaweeds is an amazing perennial. Now, if I can just submit to the economists, and we do a cost accounting, and you don't have to put any seeds, you don't have to put any weed control, you don't have to do any fertilizer, the only thing you do is harvest, do we agree it's most likely competitive? Most likely. Can we start with a working hypothesis? And what we do today is we take in the seaweeds, we wash off the plastics. The plastics, we don't know which plastics they are because they're microplastics, no seal to be found on there. The microplastics go through pyrolysis. Pyrolysis generates thin gas at high temperature. And the thin gas we mix with the CH4, the methane gas, produced from fermenting the seaweeds. So we have CH4, we have CO2, CO, hydrogen. We combine, we have a massive generation of gas. We made the calculation for Morocco. With 4,500 square kilometers of seaweed farming, Morocco creates a barrier against microplastics to come onto the shore, protecting the fragile life of the crustaceans, the fishes, protecting the life of these few hundred meters where biodiversity is rich, but at the same time, with 4,500 square kilometers, we can make Morocco independent in gas. 4,500 square kilometers, but keep in mind, multiplied by 25 meter deep. This is the three dimensions. We have to think in three dimensions. And when people say 4,500, that's a lot. Well, may I remind you that today in America, there is more than 4.2 million square kilometers farmed in corn. So, if you talk about 4,500 compared to millions, we're talking about a tiny intervention. The cost of shale gas, gas de schist, de schiste, <coughs> the cost of shale gas is a multiple of the cost of seaweed gas. Why? Because we have multiple cash flow. One, we restore the ecosystem for the fisheries. Two, we have the gas. Three, when you have digested the seaweed, your solid residue, which is only 3%, but that solid residue is 50% phosphate. Phosphate today is indispensable 
for our agriculture. When I have three cash flow, I beat shale gas. On top of that, I'm restoring the ecosystem. On top of that, I'm cleaning the ocean of microplastics. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how I see business in the future. It's good business. It's competitive business. It's great for the environment. And we are a job engine. For every hectare, it's one job. We have not seen job generation like that. And coastal communities like you in Italy have so many. We need to think creatively how to generate jobs and how to have jobs that generate value. <coughs> Some people tell me that the idea of the seaweed is a fantasy. I welcome fantasy. We need to start with fantasy. And then with the signs and the hypothesis, we can move to a vision. And when we have a vision around which industry comes together, then you can translate it into a business reality. This is how I've approached, ladies and gentlemen, our work for the past 25 years. I'm very privileged to have more than 3,000 scientists in our network, but at the same time, we have over 1,000 entrepreneurs in our network. Translate vision into reality requires the entrepreneur. No entrepreneur, only politicians and NGOs. It doesn't make it happen. And I think this is, to me, the key element, and therefore, I'm pleased to be here. I am a product of the Club of Rome, Club di Roma. Who read the book, Limits to Growth? All over, no, no you're not over 60. You're, uh, <laughs> you know, 47 years ago, the report Limits to Growth described what is happening today. If you keep on growing and keep on consuming, you come to a point that you're polluting too much. Not only did the Club of Rome said you will exhaust the earth, the Club of Rome report said you will pollute the world. Now, I had the privilege of working with Dr. Aurelio Pecei, il fondatore del Club di Roma who was a great visionary at this time. And working with him for four years, at the conclusion of a couple of years, he said, Gunther, <coughs> never work for a multinational. Never join Fiat. Never join Olivetti. <coughs> never join McKinsey. Stay out, be independent. I followed that advice and I have the privilege of a 40 year long professional career without having worked for anyone else. This is a great privilege. It's also a sign of capacity to survive against all odds. One of my companies was a small detergent company called Ecover. It was quasi bankrupt. I took it over. And we relaunched the factory in 1991, ladies and gentlemen. This was the first factory in the world to have zero waste, zero rifiuti, zero emissioni, zero. Now, there's one thing with zero, you can't negotiate. Zero is zero. And one of my challenges was how could I have zero? CO2 emissions, 1991. Well, the only way is that you secure all your staff comes to work on a bicycle. If your people don't come on a bicycle to work, I'm sorry, you have emissions. And I had to use 
some incentive for people to come on a bicycle to work. In Belgium, it rains, and in the rain in the winter, it's not pleasant to be on a bicycle. So I had a very simple solution. I paid my staff half a euro for every kilometer they ride the bicycle to work. For half a euro, all the Belgians come on a bicycle to work. <laughs> My friends in the business said, this is expensive. I mean, going for zero emissions is very expensive. I said, no. Even though they didn't teach me at INSEAT in Fontainebleau when I did my MBA, I made a simple calculation. If I have to buy the land for 120 cars, I must pave the parking, put a gate, light, security, ticket, and all of that. That whole budget translated in kilometers bicycle to work was good for five years five years i could pay people and i thought after five years they get used to it then of course the smart economist says what's your return on investment my return on investment is the health of my people because if my people are exercising two times a day all year winter summer they're in good shape. And if they're in good shape, productivity goes up. I have longer loyalty of my workers. This is how we have to think as business people. How can we get better results all the time using and leveraging our funds? Leveraging the cash that we have to invest needs to be thought through, not just with banks but the leveraging we can do in order to get a multiple effect in our businesses. But in 1993, I was invited to Indonesia. I had become one of the biggest buyers of palm oil. And they gave me the red carpet. There I realized that I am destroying the habitat of the orangutan. Here is the guru, the green guru, with everyone going on a bicycle, ecological factory, no waste, but destroying the habitat of the orangutan. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we have to insist. Business needs to create value, but the word value in English, valore, is also ethics. You need to have the ethics in the business. If you know you are destroying rainforest and habitat of orangutan in Indonesia, you make a lot of money, you can't continue. You must change your model. And that's the reason that I accepted in 1994 the invitation of the United Nations University to work for three years in Tokyo to prepare for the Kyoto Protocol. None of my proposals were accepted. They were a bit too crazy. But I've learned. I've learned a lot that we have to think in a system. We have to connect things. I cannot just work with my business in Belgium. I need to connect it with Indonesia. I need to see how my purchasing strategy impacts life on Earth. And one of the most beautiful lessons for me is Yellowstone Park. Who has been to Yellowstone Park? It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. But when the people shot all the wolves, the elk population increased. And by the increase of the elk population, they were all grazing along the rivers. And by overgrazing on the rivers, due to the lack of the wolves, there was massive erosion on the rivers. And the massive erosion of the rivers 
led to less drainage of water into the soil. Then the wolf was reintroduced. And the reintroduction of the wolf led immediately to a control of the number of elks and deer. And by reducing the number of deer, the riverbanks could grow again. Erosion dropped. The meandering of the river became much better. Higher penetration of water and nutrients, because the river, as you know, in the mountains gives you minerals. And the increased amount of drainage with nutrition, minerals into the soil, regenerated the whole ecosystem. We very often forget that we as human beings have a hard time understanding how nature really works. If we understand that with the reintroduction of the wolf, we ensured the health of the whole ecosystem, including the way the rivers are flowing, then we know how to design good business that is good for the environment. Now, unfortunately, very few people teach us. That's one of the reasons why I decided to write my book, The Blue Economy, in order to have concrete examples. Because we need to be inspired by the concrete examples. Now, if you introduce a wolf, you cannot think about maximizing. You're looking at optimizing. And this is one of the big shifts we have to introduce in business. Because when we maximize, we will always have collateral damage. Always. But if we optimize, we can make a dynamic balance. This is really the extraordinary work that Italy has been doing in chemistry thanks to the pioneering efforts of Katia Bastioli. Who knows La Dottoressa Katia Bastioli? You don't know Katia. <laughs> Google right away. Katia Bastioli is the CEO of Novamont. Ah, but without Katia, no Novamont. So why do you know the company and not the lady behind you, ladies in particular? Katia Bastioli is a chemical engineer. She was in charge of bioplastics in the research center of Raul Gardini. You know what happened to Raul Gardini in Montedison. But she persevered with her bioplastics laboratory. Today, she works mainly with cardo. Cardo, which is considered a weed. For 40 years in Italy, often by law, you're spraying chemicals on cardo to kill it. Now, if after 40 years, you have to still spray, change your thinking. Because according to Einstein, if you do more of the same, expecting better results, you're stupid. So don't be stupid. Change. Now, the cardo has a seed because it's like an artichoke. The seed has an oil. The oil you can submit to pressure and temperature. You have an acid. But the stem of the cardo, which is one, two meters high, that stem has cellulose. Cellulose is a sugar. A sugar you ferment into an alcohol. You follow me? I'm sorry for the lesson in chemistry. <laughs> but when you have an alcohol and an acid, you have a monomer. If you have a monomer, you have polymer. That's plastics. Plastics is easy. We've made it very difficult by taking it out of petroleum, but you can do it with beetroots, as we do in Botrige. 
we are converting beetroot to the alcohol with a fermentation. And the genius of Katia Bastioli is that she has converted all petrochemical facilities that are not competitive into bio refineries. Today, already five petrochemical facilities in Italy have been converted to bio facilities. Italy is number one in the world. No one does that. Katia Bastioli, la italiana, la dottoressa, she does it. And of course she has opposition. Of course the petrochemical industry doesn't like to see this. But on the other hand, it's a unique initiative to introduce the bioeconomy with materials that are in abundance. It is not about converting corn into a plastic. It's converting what we don't eat into a plastic. Because we have to use what we have and what we can regenerate. Lubrificanti. Lubrificanti from a bio source. How come that Italy, with all your equipment and machinery, is still, for the hydraulic lubricants, dependent on fossil fuel lubricants? Doesn't make sense. Now, the only company that makes the biolubricants is Novamont, made with Cardo from Sardinia. Now, that kind of logic I would like you to see. There are hundreds of initiatives that could be developed around the logic and the science of Novamont. Novamont today has more than 1,200 patents. 1,200 patents. This is a bomb in science. Or it indicates that no one else is doing anything. Because if no one else is doing anything, you have a field to develop your know-how. But the beauty is, if you work with Cardo, then you have this dust, white dust on the flower. And una nonna, an old lady, came to see the factory and said, do you have some of the dust when you collect the Cardo? We had no idea about the dust. She told us. And we saw there was this dust. She said, that I need to make goat cheese. <laughs> Formaggio di capro fatto con cardo. Enzimi di cardo. Wow. We didn't know. We have 2,000 tons of it. It's enough to make all formaggi di capra in tutta Italia. <laughs> but Italy is importing genetically modified enzymes to make cheese. I'm sorry. What did you do to your food? even with Carlo Petrini making such extraordinary work. Industry in the cheese business is using a lot of synthetic enzymes. Doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. Made in Italia should be naturale, bio. These are the factories. This is a picture here of the old Portatores facility where the new biochemical factory is located. Ladies and gentlemen, I know there are everywhere in Italy old petrochemical facilities. You should not think closing down. You should think transformation to bio. Because you are endowed with fertile land. You are endowed with extraordinary sea. And when you have the sea and the land, with the thousands of kilometers, you are predestined to produce biomass. And biomass is not just food and gas, it's chemistry. That was the vision of Raul Gardini. He thought that in the future, chemistry should be sugar. He was too early, we know. But we have to think about energy sources. I'm not an engineer, I'm only an economist. 
So I crunch the numbers. I want to make certain that the margins are good. If the margins are no good, we don't move. And so one of the initiatives we thought was urgent was in the mix of energy. I'm not interested in solar, wind, hydrogen, battery. I'm interested in the mix because we all know it's base load and peak delivery. And if you don't mix, so where is the artificial intelligence that allows me at a small scale to create the best mix? So the only way we could take this to a high tech level was by building a new boat. The boat is 512 square meters of solar panel. We take seawater in the boat. We desalinize, deionize, convert to hydrogen. We have 200 liter of hydrogen produced per day. That gives us eight days of propulsion. If we use the solar panels and we have eight tons of lithium batteries in the boat, we have propulsion for one day. Eight tons, one day. 200 liters, eight days. Do you want to know more about batteries or hydrogen? I did not know. Because none of the literature spelled out so bluntly the efficiency of hydrogen. But somehow everyone is working on batteries. More efficient batteries, more compact batteries. We have decided to work on the option, no batteries, zero battery. Why? Because in nature, no one uses a battery. The whale pumps 1,000 liters of blood every heartbeat. 1,000 liters with 6 volt direct current. And the engineers in the pump business say, that's not possible. No, not for you as engineer. But in nature, all the whales do it. So try to inspire the young people to think pump like a whale instead of pump like your machine is doing today. That's the kind of visions we need. Now the boat has been going now for 45,000 kilometers around the world. We have proven in all the seas that we do not need fossil fuel. But we need the intelligence of the management. The boat is like a self-sailing boat. We take in all the data from satellites and from local currents and our situation. But we realize not one captain in the world is educated to operate that. Captains are not educated to operate like this. They're educated to put on GPS and engines. And if you have people educated like that, don't ever think they will reach sustainability. But moving from the robots and the mix of artificial intelligence in energy, let's move to something very basic. Majali. Pigs. You know, we often look for too much innovation with too much technology. Sometimes we just have to learn to be close to the reality of life. And the reality of life is, as you know, pigs are amazing animals. They are smart and they're very intelligent, productive, but they're often missing their friends. Pigs are pigs and chickens are chickens. The European Union keeps them apart. I don't know why, they've always lived together. So we put them back together. The Europeans said, you can't do that. And we said, we'll do it anyway. Sometimes 
you have to say that. Of course, under the guidance of scientific research. We designed, and this is 50 kilometers southeast of Munich in Bavaria, we designed the houses where on the ground floor lives the pig and on the top floor lives the chicken. The chicken keeps the pigs clean of all insect and parasite and larvae. We have now 25 year track record of the health of the pig when the chickens are around. But the European objected, Union objected, to have the pig in the house with the chicken. So we understood why. And of course the problem is the excrement of the pig. So we propose something the European Union had not heard before. We will teach the pig to go to the toilet before going into the house. And they thought we were crazy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today we teach our pigs in three days to go to the toilet. Now, if you have pigs that go to the toilet in a very small space, like you and I do, then you reduce the labor costs enormously. You don't have to clean anymore. The big objection of workers with pigs is the cleaning of the pigs. We don't have cleaning. If you want during the coffee break, I tell you how we teach the pigs. <laughs> but it took me, according to my mom, six weeks to be clean. The pig, three days. And my mom told me afterwards, still some accident. <laughs> the pig, no accident. But what is the beauty of this? If the pig sleeps downstairs, the chicken feel very safe. When chicken feels safe, she lay more eggs. Second, in the winter time when it's cold, the pig gives natural warmth. When chickens are warm, they lay more eggs. Not eating more, laying more eggs. Productivity in egg laying goes up 30%. 30% without feet. That is a revolution. How do we try to do it in industry now? Chickens are obese chickens. They have an obesity gene in them, so they get fat very fast. Do you want to eat obese chickens? I mean, I? No, thank you. But chickens that live with the pigs have an amazing effect. So the eggs go up, but we don't kill the pig after five to six months. We give the pig minimum one year. <laughs> The industry said, you will go bankrupt. Competition, pricing, impossible to keep a pig feed, fed for a year. We do actually one year and two months. What was our logic? If a pig of the right races, right type, lives 14 months, naturally the pork meat has a very high incidence of omega-3. Pigs are bombs of omega-3, provided they live 12 to 14 months. So, today the customer buys salmon. Why? Omega-3. At what price? Three times the price of pork. So, what do we do? The organization, the foundation that heads this program, has 34 stores around Munich, and we sell pork the same price as salmon. <laughs> well, why not? You inform the customer. And you know, particularly in Germany, but maybe northern Italy is about the same. If they have the choice between a salmon and a good pork, they take pork. <laughs> and the salmon comes from Norway farmed in big cages with a lot of lice. 
So, this is Hermannsdorfer Landwerkstätte. This is headed by Mr. Karl Ludwig Schweisfurt, who was the founder of Hertha. You know Hertha, the sausages? Number one sausage maker in the world. No, Europe, not the world. And Hertha, he sold to Nestlé with the money he made, he decided. Let me summarize. 100 hectares of land, 20 million euro turnover, 40 mil 4 million euro profit. How many farms do you know? How many farms do you know? For that price, everyone is a farmer. <laughs> Particularly if you don't have to clean the pigs. <laughs> I think, ladies and gentlemen, we need to tell the story to children. Because when children are with pigs, they love them. And they're very friendly. But we have turned the pig into a machine to make prosciutto. We should not. We can have a tremendous increase in quality, quality of life, quality of the price. And permit me to talk about this. Pagnolini. I am father of six children, so I know. I not only know how it looks when it's nice, I know how it looks when it's been used. Ah, look a little bit longer. What do you do with this? Well, we throw away to the landfill or incinerator. So we decided to redesign the Pagnolini. And the core product is, of course, Bioplastici de Novamont. We use the bioplastics. And we fill it with fiber from bamboo. Bamboo, you cut, grows again. You cut, grows again. Cut, grows again. I like that. <laughs> this is the force of nature. 70 times you can cut bamboo and it'll grow again. 70 times. Why do we want to genetically modify a tree to do that? I, I don't get it. Unless you're in the tree business, then I understand. We take the cellulose and we mix with charcoal, bamboo charcoal. Why? Because it's very good for the skin. But charcoal plus cellulose plus the plastic plus the excrement of the baby gives you, in the end of the day, an outstanding product and the business model is a bit surprising we give the diaper for free for free on the condition you bring the use the diaper back so every saturday morning in berlin mom and dad come with two tons of diapers to a central point and they receive new diapers. Why? I don't know if you realize that if you turn the diaper with bamboo, bioplastics and charcoal into biochar, into rich terra preta, very rich in black soil and nutrition, every baby produces a thousand kilograms per year. One ton per year. That one ton of black earth we use to grow fruit trees. Mele. Because a fruit tree needs a lot of nutrition in its early phase. One kilogram of black earth gives me one fruit tree. Can we calculate together? One baby, thousand kilograms. Thousand kilograms, thousand trees. After five years, 50 kilograms of mele. Every baby, 50 tons of fruits. Wow. So which business are we? We're selling trees. We're selling trees because it is impossible to say no to this tree. It's made from the best of the baby. <laughs> Everyone likes those trees. You know, 
Pordenone will not have enough space to plant trees. How many babies are born in your city? Thousand per year? Less? Five hundred? But can you imagine? Every baby is a thousand trees. Every tree is a fruit tree. Every fruit tree is 50 kilograms. You would be the city of fruits. <laughs> and you do it with what? With what you have. That is blue economy. Blue economy is working with what you have. Can we talk about a cup of coffee? And ladies and gentlemen, when my time is up, you must tell me. I don't stop. <laughs> I can keep going for days. <laughs> Coffee is so important in the morning, no? You I, I, I need coffee in the morning. But I am not worried about the future of Lavazza, Illy and Segafredo. I am worried about the farmer who's supplying the coffee. Because even after 30 years of fair trade, they're still losing business. The study made by the Neumann Group, which is the largest trader in coffee in the world, is that by, 20, 20, by 2050, there will only be eight exporting countries left. Because with the big groups of coffee, the supply chain management does not permit to work with too many small farmers. The small coffee farmers will be for boutique coffee shops, but not for the mainstream. So I have been thinking, what can we do? We have worked many years with the solid waste on the farm and the solid waste after espresso or macchiato. You know, I have an incredible team around the world from Professor Shooting Chang from China, Carmenza Jaramillo from Colombia, and Chiro Govera, who's my daughter I've adopted. She is the queen of mushrooms in Africa. She grows mushrooms on coffee waste. There is a company already in Italy, Fungi Espresso, Espresso Fungi. They are making out of the waste of coffee mushrooms and sell those quite successfully. You know, the space to do this in Italy would be at least 1,000 companies. 1,000. This would be ideal for young people to get a job sell something healthy 1000 companies would be 3000 jobs who's creating 3000 jobs today without subsidy without the government i think we sometimes need to take things in hand as a child this is my son all my children learn at the age of three how to farm mushrooms <laughs> some parents teach the children lego I teach mushroom farming. <laughs> because if they understand, as at the age of three, I can take the coffee waste from mom, I can put in a little seed. Two weeks later, mom is cooking my mushrooms. You have changed sustainability, circular thinking, bioeconomy forever. We need to have every child learning how to farm fungi. This is how we transform society. We have today large operations around the world. We have more than 5,000 coffee to mushroom farms already. And when people say, Gunter, what a success, I'm saying, excuse me, it should be one million. We should have one million. We need healthier food for our children. Do you agree? And mushrooms doesn't have the cholesterol, saturated fatty acids. It's a healthy food. I don't have to convince you Italians with your porcini. You know it. 
But why don't we turn it into a job engine? Generation of waste converted to food. And the beauty is that also here the European Union told us you can't use waste to create food. And we explained the only thing you do is add hot water. And with hot water we're sterilizing. Since we've sterilized, you have reduced the energy cost by 60%. So mushroom farming, 60% cheaper energy, good food, raw material for free. Do you think you can be competitive? Of course you can. And even a young entrepreneur can do it. What we think is important is to go to the next steps. Because if you do the mushrooms, the farmer will earn double. We wanted to have more income to the farmer. Because we realized even double is not good enough. So we thought, what can we do with a cherry? This is called a cherry, a coffee cherry. We got very inspired by this man. You know him, George Clooney. He is not promoting Lavazza. Everyone knows it's Nespresso. He has received $120 million for holding the cup of coffee. <laughs> so every lady who sees that makes the Nespresso machine coffee, thinks she is having coffee with George Clooney. <laughs> I'm being told I should be a bit faster. So give me five minutes if I may negotiate. Cinque minuti. Okay, cinque minuti, minuti italiani. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> There was a king in Belgium called Leopold II. He was an atrocious king. He cut off arms when people didn't collect enough. But he had invested in cacao in the Congo. But Europe decided the drink is not cacao, it's coffee and tea. The, the Brits took the tea, the French, the Germans, the Scandinavians, took the coffee. So he got stuck with too much cacao. So he invited a few Belgian noble families to figure out what to do with the cacao. And the Belgians said, well, we have milk, we have sugar beets, we'll mix it, and today that is called chocolate. That was a rescue operation for the bankruptcy of the king of Belgium. So, the king was a smart marketeer. Because how was he going to convince people who did not buy the cacao to drink, how are they going to eat it now? So he decided that next to every coffee served in the palace in Brussels, he would add a chocolate. We're still doing it today. I have used the same logic to create solid coffee. This is solid coffee. We have a solid coffee that with only 10 grams, 10 grams, you have the same caffeine as with a double espresso. Or, since the coffee bean has a lot of amino acids, you have a bomb of amino acids and caffeine. The caffeine is released over four hours in your body. It's exactly what you need when you're a gamer. Instead of Red Bull, we now compete with solid coffee. But if you sell this piece of coffee at the same price as a Red Bull, you know how much that is per ton of coffee? 100,000 euro. Only when you do cocaine and marijuana, you do better. 
So what we're thinking is that we need to have in our innovation of business models, we need to have real innovations in product design, process designs, because otherwise your business model is not supported. To conclude, chlorophyll and plants. Every plant, ladies and gentlemen, has two chlorophylls, A and B. The plant is green and therefore green light is reflected by the plant. Therefore, the plant wants to get the light that is on the yellow side and on the red side. Therefore, it needs two chlorophylls. But if I have two light frequencies and I have the sun, what do I know? I know where I am and I know the date. Plants have a GPS and a calendar without satellites, without watches and clocks. The DNA analysis doesn't tell us any of that. The analysis tells us about the molecule and the chemistry, but it doesn't tell us how the plant wants to grow with light. And maybe you remember a book called Genesis. The first words of God in Genesis say, let there be light. He didn't say, let's have chemistry. <laughs> he didn't say, let's do some genetic manipulation with the seeds. He said, let there be light. Ladies and gentlemen, we have transformed that now in a new technology that allows us to use an LED lamp that gives us the frequencies exactly the ones that the plant wants. We don't want blue light. We don't want green light. We want to have the light spectrum that promotes the growth. Strawberries in six weeks. We have salads in less than six weeks. From seeds, only in soil. No chemistry, no genetics required. It means that the revolution of food production is going through a dramatic transformation. We have the first tulip farms in the Netherlands where we can time the tulip to the 14th of February, St. Valentine's Day. Exactly the day before we have 50 million flowers. Because if the tulip goes too fast, we reduce the light. If it's too slow, we change the light. As a result, we can time without using chemistry or genetics. This leads us to a different big data management because we can use the light to change the frequency when an insect arrives. Insects have very specific light frequencies within which they do not want to be. You change the frequency, 20 minutes, insect gone. You have a fungus that's attacking, you change the light frequency, fungus is gone. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in front of a complete revolution. And this is because we're starting to understand light. We thought 5G is going to change the internet. No, ladies and gentlemen, it'll be light. Every light bulb on the street will have the capacity to tell you date and GPS. We don't need satellites anymore. Satellites are solutions of the past. They're expensive. And there are a lot of pollution of it in the air. We can turn every light bulb Every public light around the world is converted into the same functions as a satellite. This is going to be the transformation of cities. This is going to mean that your public light is not a cost, but your public light is transforming into the backbone of a 3D Internet. To conclude, Internet today is 2D just like our farming is 2D. The engineers know that moving from 2D to 3D is a quantum jump. We know that the opportunities for farming by having 3D is a quantum jump. Internet in 3D is a quantum jump. Our children and our eyes are all predestined to operate in 3D. We're not 2D. 2D is an oversimplification of reality. And that's the internet we have, and that's what 5G will give you. Today, 
Our laboratories in China and in France are operating at an internet with light at 252 gigs per second. And what you need to do, change the light bulb. It's so simple, it's embarrassing. We would have expected a bit more difficult solutions. But since we have not been teaching light except for decoration, we've not been teaching light as a source of life, we are missing these opportunities. All what I do and all the projects I have been able with an incredible team to put into practice, all have been translated into favole, children's stories. I have only one request to all of you. You can forget anything I said. But I would like you to take a pledge that from now on every day you will tell a child during three minutes a positive story about the amazing things that we didn't know. And if you tell that amazing story every day and you search for those stories and you tell those stories, ladies and gentlemen, we will change the world. Thank you. Grazie, grazie al professor Paoli per questa presentazione veramente affascinante, molto impattante e che ha lanciato anche tanti agganci a quelle che saranno le presentazioni che vedremo nel seguito, nel seguito della, della manifestazione legate alle tecnologie dell'idrogeno e soprattutto alle bioplastiche. Noi avremo dei relatori anche da Novamont che presenteranno alcune delle attività di questa importantissima, importantissima azienda. E... Se qualcuno vuole fare qualche brevissima domanda, siamo un po' in ritardo, ma ci proviamo lo stesso. Quindi se qualcuno ha delle domande, il professor Paoli ha detto che è disponibile a rispondere. Prego. Are you working on insects? Yes, um, we work a lot with insects. Not for you and me to eat. That we have... Well, I don't even give it to the pigs, although the pigs like cockroaches, but people don't like pigs who eat cockroaches. So, insects, yes. We have um, more than a dozen projects on converting slaughterhouse waste into protein with insects. The largest production is in Cape Town, South Africa, because within the European Union, they don't allow you. Today, you can only have insects eating plant-based material for cold-blooded animals like fish. <coughs> we expect the European Union will change the outdated logic of the mad cow disease by 2022, by 2024, by the end of the new commission. But if just Africa were to use all slaughterhouse wastes, convert to larvae, fed fresh to chickens and quails, we generate 500,000 jobs. We started our first insect operation 1986 in Benin. We have a long experience of the science. It's the prohibition of the European Union that blocks. We are paying 150, 200 euro to burn the waste from the slaughterhouse instead of turning it into a massive engine of protein. Nature always cleans carcasses with insects. That's what nature does. So let's learn from nature. Cape Town is now at 50 tons of insect per day. 50 ton. Just raised in London more than 100 million euro 
to take it to 100 tons per day. Brisbane, Australia is planning a thousand tons per day protein from larvae for fish farming. And it is urgent because today we use too much fish meal. We're harvesting herring and anchovies to feed the animals. And since we're overfishing, we're killing it out. We have to go back to nature. Nature tells us the fly is the miracle. And just for one data, if I have one kilogram, one kg, one kilo of eggs of a fly with slaughterhouse waste, in four or five days, this becomes 375 kilograms of protein. The efficiency of protein by the fly is beating soy, it's beating palm oil, it's beating everyone. And this is why I claim in my books, Blue Economy, in my book, uh, 3D Economy, you know, how come we don't learn from nature? Where is the highest efficiency? Why do we impose limitations that lead to joblessness and that leads to hunger in the world. In nature, there's no hunger, nor joblessness. Thank you. Vorrei, vorrei che rispondesse ancora una domanda che si... Sì, sì Vanni, prego, dai. Well, thank you for a very mm. fine talk. Um, so you've uh, shown very nice... You, you've show. shown very nice examples of uh, uh, both... Uh, economic and uh, environmental sustainability. I, I've seen, though, many elements of social sustainability as well. Um, how do you plan those? And uh, I, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on those. Thank you for your question. Of course, I had announced I should speak to you a few days, not uh, an hour. But your question is very much to the point. We're using mathematical modeling. So we are using the mathematics model that was developed in the 60s by Professor Jay Forrester at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We're using mathematical modeling. It's called system dynamics. And the system dynamics allow us to put in both the financial numbers, the social numbers, the environmental numbers. We can create an interrelationship, a web of data that allows us to see how many jobs do we generate, what pay can we give, what's the impact on nature. And we always do this over a minimum 20-year time frame. So we can really see what's the impact of what we do. So that is why we know that if we do slaughterhouse waste in Africa, we know how many jobs we can we generate. And this allows us to push the policymaker to have longer term vision. Because of course, if you transform the economy in two or four years, you don't see the full impact. That is the reason why in our methodology, we have one model, for example, for the flies, but in the same region, we will do at least six other projects. And as such, we have a transformation of the local economy. By having these six initiatives, each individually modeled mathematically, we then integrate those models and we see how we transform a local economy. But I thank for the question because the core is mathematics. It's differentials. That means that all my team that works on our projects must study differentials, must study mathematical modeling. They don't have to know business plans. They don't have to know Excel spreadsheet. That for me is not important. The mathematical modeling because this allows transparency 
everyone sees what is happening. And if you disagree with the numbers, change the numbers. Learn how to do the differentials with other data. Transparency is the first. Second, it allows us to have a negotiation of how much is enough. Because we can maximize or we can optimize for everyone. And we very quickly see impact on health or impact on preservation of culture and tradition. We can include these qualitative factors into this mathematical modeling. So we have transparency and we can negotiate how much is enough. And to me, the most important new deal in society is how much is enough. Because the rich getting filthy rich and the poor getting poor is not a model that will long term work. And so therefore, we think the social agreement based on more value that is created, not on sharing the existing, but on creating more value, that is the technique we need to use to have society agree on how do we transform to a much more ecological society that is more competitive and has better results for the community. Mathematics is at the core. Thank you.